I grew up here in Salt River Indian community on the east side of the reservation. Um, there's an area that it used to be called Evergreen a long time ago. It's on the in the Lehigh District, the northern part of Lehigh District, and that's where my family originates from. It's from Lehigh. I lived there most of my life and changed a lot. Back then there was nothing but mesquite trees and cottonwoods and everything. Now it's all cleared down. There's no trees anywhere. The farmers yanked them out of the ground and people cut the trees down for wood. And so, but I, I grew up here mainly, just here really in, in this community. In English we say Maricopa, but there's different types of, of Maricopas. Like the people from here, mainly from this area, where Lehigh, where my relatives come from, my family comes from, those people are referred to as Chachadum. We call ourselves Chachadum, which is a, means upriver or towards the water. And uh, the people from Levine, that they, we just call them Pipakave, or Western people, you know. Um, but even in those groups, there used to be farther, America was farther west, you know, that, we, that were called Kabel Chadum and Helakumai and Korhan. But, their lineage is, is lost. I mean, they, they mingle with the other groups and, and they, they just became a Maricopa, even though they technically are something else. A lot of times when we collect the clay, it's, it's, um, it's hard to get to nowadays because there's roadblocks all over, literally roadblocks all over the place. The, uh, whoever, I don't know who owns the land or whatever, is controlling the access to the mountain. And so a lot of times it's, it's hard to get to. Well, that's not it. Whenever we're getting ready to make pottery, we, um, we have to collect our materials and that calls for us going out to the mountain or to wherever the clay's at and um, going and collect, you know, taking all our tools, buckets and uh, pick and whatever we're using to go out there and wh wherever it's at we have to get to it and then we have to dig it clear the ground get it ready and then start digging out the clay and we, we only try to bring back it's just the clay we try to take out all the rocks and whatever well clay location is secret because you don't want anybody messing up the clay because a lot of times people want to help you and they don't know how to dig clay and they just tear up the clay beds and and then sometimes there's really good clay and you don't want anybody else to mess it up to ruin it so you only want to be the only one to collect from that spot but there's communal spots that everybody collects from it's just that uh, everybody has their own way of digging and collecting and sometimes it's not exactly what you want so it's better to just dig it yourself and keep it to yourself it's a lot of work a lot of people don't want to do that work i mean digging clay is hard and, you know, to, and then that's just digging it. It has to be processed, and that's another whole section right there. Cutting the right kind of wood, it just, it's not something that, I mean, you spend a lot of time on pottery, making just one pot. And I don't mean to talk bad about the generations, but I do think it's generational. A lot of it's uh, younger. The younger they get, the less committed they are to anything. Mm -hmm. that's good. It's hard for young people to say, I'm gonna do this and stick with it. They do it like one time, two times. Well, I don't like it. I'm not going to do it no more. This is what we got. Yeah, this is what I normally get. So, just like rocks. To break them up into a powder. That's, this comes in the pestle. Because a lot of times the clays have a lot of rock in there and you don't want all that rock with it. But we try to take as much of it out as possible and collect it right on the spot and then we bring it home and process more, it, it again, even more, to a finer uh, material. Well, to be honest, I didn't really want to work in clay. I, it wasn't a dream of mine to do this. I mean, it just kind of happened. and. Um, uh, but as I got older and there were people would talk to me and say, you know, you should, you should learn to make pottery. You know, you, you're real artistic. You can do all kinds of things. You should try it. I'm, 
<laughs> I don't know about that. But anyway, um, the museum, our museum here, the Hulagum Key Museum, had a, a pottery class, and Phyllis Stern and her daughter, Avis Pinion, were the teachers, and so I took the class, and she would say that. She'd say, do you think you could make pottery all the time? Like, I guess, I don't know, I guess, yeah, if I found all the right stuff, and I guess I could. And she would, you should make pottery, you can, you can do it. And, and as the years went along, she'd say, you should, you should do it. Nobody's, nobody's making pottery anymore, you should make pottery. You pull the clay down over the edging, don't worry about how rough it looks, It'll, the paddle will fix it. The traditional way of making pottery is uh, for our tribe is the, using a paddle and anvil technique. And so we have a wooden paddle that you use on the outside to help shape the pot and to smooth it out. And then on the inside you use, you hold a small stone uh, on the inside of the pot, pot as you're working. And the, the, both the stone and the paddle thin the walls of the clay, of the uh, walls of the pot, I mean. And um, are used to help shape the pot as well as your hands. I think the people have become too detached from their own tradition that they don't really see it as something important to teach their kids or to have them learn. And so it's kind of hard, you know. They're, I'm going to use a phrase from the Bible. In the Bible, it says, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And that is very true with all people, especially people who want to learn to make pottery. They talk a good talk, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. But the actions don't actually come out, and they don't, you never see the finished product. And it's hard to encourage them. You know, you try to encourage them to do it, but that work part that comes with it is what makes them stop. I always try to encourage people, I think, that are, are naturals at it, you know, because there are people that are, are real good at making pottery, they are real artistic. The same way that, you know, they saw that in me, I see it in them too. This is where we have our pottery gathering. Actually, we do it in several places, but this, we usually use the Cultural Resource Department classroom because you know we do it on Saturdays when nobody's here and um, they have allowed me to use their building their classroom so I normally host my classes here I never really taught polishing to most of them I mean that I think this last class was the first time I taught polishing back in July I think that's the first time I never did it before because it was a lot of work just making the pots already so I didn't teach that part same with drawing. I didn't teach that. Only this past year I started teaching drawing uh, with the clay paints, you know, because it was too much work. Well, I started trying to do that, trying to encourage them to come. We're going to make pots on this day. Come and, come and make pots. And then they say, well, I don't have clay. Well, we have clay. You just got to come over here sometime that week and process it and get it ready, and you can have clay on Saturday. And I'm not stingy with it. I don't try to say you can only take so much, you know. I don't do that. You know, the clay's there, and they want to get it use it. I let them take it and I don't argue with them about it, you know. I just let them do it. And, but the point was behind it is that I'm trying to make them make pots on a regular basis and just and on make pots on their own even. I try to tell some of them, you know, you should borrow, I let them take the paddle and the molds, the, you know, different things, tools, you know, make a pot at home, bring it back. And, I normally do the red clay paint, which is uh, basically just red clay that's been diluted in water. And um, I use that most of the time to paint on white pots. But I also make white paint from the same clay that we make the pottery from. We make a paint out of that. And sometimes I make brown pots or red pots and I paint them with the, the white. If you're doing the red clay paint, you have to have you make your clay paint first. Um, that's um, it's just red clay that's been diluted in water and then poured through a cloth and so it strains out all the sand and all the rocks and makes a pure clay and that, that's what you that uh, the, it settles it's like it's all like like milky milky water red milky water
after the water settles and the clay separates and it settles to the bottom, you pour off all the water as much as you can. And that sludge that you get that to the bottom, that's what you use for the paint. That's just the red clay. And um, when you're ready to do your, your vessel, the paint on your pot, then you have to smooth the pot itself too because a lot of times the pots get like a sandy feel from the grit, from the temper. So you have to smooth that out first, take a stone to it, a wet stone and smooth it out. And then once it's all done, been smoothed it out, that's when you draw on it. You use your, use your, I just use a regular commercial paint brush and you dip it in the paint and then you draw on there. Just draw all over whatever you're gonna put on there. Or if you're gonna do a red slip, then you put it, you have to put it all over the pot. And But the only thing wrong with the red slip is you, you have to, you have to polish it before it dries while it's still damp. And so you have to work quick because a lot of times it dries out before you're ready. You have to kind of keep putting water on it. But the more water you put on it, then it starts changing the color. It starts changing either lightening, lightening it up or sometimes, especially if the clay is salty, it'll get like this white looking thing on there, you know? So um, you do all that. But you draw, normally draw and, and, or, or slip first. Do all that, cover the whole pot, whatever you're doing. When you're ready to fire, then that's, and usually the, once the clay touches the pot, the paint, it absorbs real quick and it, there's no room for mistakes. You, if you make a mistake, you have to change your pattern somehow. I actually got my first demonstration, pottery demonstration with Pueblo Grande Museum. Uh, I don't remember what year it was, but it was a long time ago. And um, I used to, they used to ask me all the time to demonstrate for their events, so that's how it started then. I just started getting asked to go all over, so now I go all over. Because a lot of it, you know, it's all educational, you know what I mean? There's hardly any potters. Even my own people don't know anything about pottery. You know, it's, so it's all about education, teaching my people and not just small people, but all people about pottery and the work that we do. The, the earth, a lot of people don't even know what the earth smells like, you know? It's just like the way that the clay smells when it's wet, it has that rain smell. Nobody even knows that because everybody's detached from nature, you know? So I talk about all of that and people are always amazed just by that and rocks, how rocks can work, you know? When we walk around the, the Verde River area, Salt River area, uh, walk around, just wander around, yeah, we're usually there for other things, but I'm always looking at the ground, so if I see a rock I like, I'll pick it up and try it out. If it works, I'll keep it. If it doesn't, I'll put it back. If you have any questions, just ask and I'll explain. Everything's all natural. We dig the clay ourselves, process it, and the paint is a, a natural paint. It's a clay paint, so we make our pots leave them plain, then we draw on them, and then we fire with wood. We use mesquite wood or cottonwood bark, either one, or both. Oh, it varies from like 300 down to like 80. Thank you. Usually you can fire the same day you draw, it just because they dry real quick. and. And so when you're ready, then you just build a fire. And, and I use a galvanized tub, I just a metal tub that I stick all my pots inside of. And uh, we build a fire first and let it burn down then to coals and we set the tub on top with uh, the pots inside and then we stack the wood around it and on top and just let it burn. That's all we do. See, and if you look at that fire, there's no smoke coming off that fire. That's the way the fire is supposed to be, clean. And the only fire that comes off should be just like steam, not real, not really like black smoke or anything of that nature. Hey, yo. Unfortunately, this is a, a dying art and it does have the possibility of dying out uh, because there really isn't anybody picking it up. I have a few people that are learning and have learned quite a bit. They don't know everything 
and I haven't, I myself don't know everything either, but there really isn't anybody that's committed themselves to making pottery and to learning all that they can learn. You know, they don't have that natural feel for it where they can see the clay in the ground or they can feel it. It's just something that they don't, it's not their, again, like I always say, they're detached from nature so much that they don't realize what's around them. And so a lot of people are like that. There's a whole generation that's like that. They don't, they never go outside, they don't do anything. So because of that, there's a good chance this is never going to continue. Yeah, there's some people who say, I know part of where I learned a little bit, but as for actually living that life and being a potter and keeping that tradition going, I don't know if that's going to continue. I have a uneasy feeling it's going to stop someday. Yep, done. It's just gonna stay there until it cools off and I can touch it. Nihan. Still a little hot, but it'll do. Mira ya.